we have uh, been looking at a few different passages of scripture in recent weeks, but uh, today we are heading back to Song of Solomon. So in your bulletins you have a uh, handout with some notes that you can follow along with. I just want to remind you of where we were last time as we're working through this uh, little eight chapter book. Uh, last week, or not last week, but last time we looked at this, we uh, were looking at chapter two. And in chapter two, there was a, uh, uh, an event that happened. The, the bride had been sitting at the table being fed by the Lord. He had been taught, uh, she'd been taught by the Lord and uh, was enjoying all of the benefits of sitting at the table um, with having the banner of his love over her, experiencing that intimate time with him. And then in chapter 2, she experiences this king coming in such a way as she has never seen him before. He's, he's skipping over the hills. Like, he's like a gazelle. He's so fast and he's moving forward. And he comes to her and he speaks to her and says, I want you to rise up from your comfort, from this experience you're having, this, this comfort zone that you're in, this banqueting table, the banner of love over you, I want you to rise up and I'm calling you to partnership with me. We're going to go to the mountains. You know, she, she's encountering this king that is unlike what she has seen before in him. She's experiencing some new characteristics. We talked about that in Sunday school as well this morning. How oftentimes we, we focus in too much on one or two characteristics of God. And we forget or neglect so many others. And so as we, as we look into these passages in chapter 3, I want you to understand there is a new work that the Holy Spirit is doing in the bride. And it is a calling forth to partnership. It's a calling forth to after you've received this down payment of the Holy Spirit, this investment of the Holy Spirit to teach you about what your identity is in, in the Lord. It's not that where you stay for the rest of your life. If, if we only, as believers, if all we ever have is this recognition of I'm saved and I'm happy in Jesus, but we never rise up to partner with Him in the things that He calls us to, then our experience with the Lord will be very much diminished. And we will experience that as we work through these uh, verses here today. So, uh, just to remind you, it said in chapter 2, Behold, He comes, leaping upon the mountains. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up! my love, my fair one, and come away. Every time in the Song of Solomon, and it's our experience in, in the real world, as it were, every time the Lord calls us to do something, He calls us because of love. He draws us in, and He declares over us how much He loves us, how passionate He is for us. See, if we, if we have that revelation of God's love for us, then we know that his leadership to go to the mountain, to the places of difficulty, then we know that his leadership is good. If we didn't have that revelation of God's love for us and his desire for us, his pursuit of us, then going to the mountain will be a whole lot more risky than it actually is if Jesus is leading the way. So I encourage you this morning as you hear what we're going to talk about, that you set your heart towards obedience the things the Lord has called you to do, it's time to rise up and start walking in that direction and do what He has asked you to do. So we saw last time that the bride refused the king's command. Now she, she refused not out of rebellion, but she refused out of immaturity. And there is a big difference. See, as baby Christians, we oftentimes still do things that are contrary to the will of God. But it's not because we're rebellious against God. It's because we are yet still immature in our faith and we need to be discipled and corrected gently. But the Lord uses discipline, which is what we're going to look at in chapter 3, to uh, cause us to want to follow him. So um, she said at the end of chapter 2, until the day breaks, turn 
my beloved, and be like a gazelle. Um, she essentially, she's saying, Jesus, I understand that you're calling me to do something. I hear your voice, but I just don't feel like I can obey. I, I, I don't know if your leadership in this, what you're calling me to, is trustworthy. And she has to grow in her understanding of who he is. So, we come to chapter 3, where it says, By night, on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. See, the, the king's response to the compromise of the bride's heart at the end of chapter 2, the king's response is he lovingly, I want you to hear this, he lovingly disciplines her. That's the heart of a father, right? The, when, when parents discipline their children, it's not because we hate the child. It's because we love the child and they are, they are doing something that is harmful to them or to others. And so God the Father, uh, Jesus, who's in view here as the king, he responds to this compromise by disciplining her. And the way he does it is he removes the tangible presence of God. Now, we need to understand something. Jesus promised us what? I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? That is a promise in Scripture. He stands on His Word. He never goes back on His Word. So that is the promise. The reality of the believer is the Lord never leaves us nor forsakes us. But what He does is He allows us to not experience His presence in a tangible way. I don't know if you've experienced I've experienced it since we've been, been together here for this last year. Uh, I've experienced numerous times, in fact, probably more so than not, the Lord's tangible presence here. I've felt that He is working, He's drawing people. And you, sometimes you could even like, like cut His presence with a knife. You could slice it. That's how thick that tangible presence was. He's always here. He promises not only won't he leave us personally, but when two or three are gathered in his name, there I am also, he says, right? So we know he is here, but sometimes it doesn't feel like it. And whenever it doesn't feel like it, it's because he wants to accomplish something in us. He wants to draw us in and make us to rise up and be obedient. So we see the bride here in this first verse she is still functioning in what her history has been. She has learned that, you know, she reads the Bible, she prays, she meditates on the Word. She's learned those are the things where she's experiencing God, where she's being fed by Him. But now she's experienced Him in a different way, where He's come like a gazelle, bouncing over the hills, just like, whoa, who on earth are you? Right? And that happens in the life of the believer. Sometimes Jesus asks us to do things that we have not experienced with him yet. And then the question is, are we going to be obedient and trust his leadership? Or are we going to stay in the comfort of the way it's always been? Right? I mean, that, that's honestly, that's the death of the church, is that one sentence. We've never done it that way before. I, I want you to say that with me, because it's true. It's the death of the church. It's the death of the church to say we've never done it this way before. Honestly. Because Jesus, I don't know if you know this, he's God. Therefore, there's a lot that we haven't experienced yet. Right? There's a lot that we haven't seen him do yet. Because he's pursuing us. He's drawing us into who he is. He's making us more like him. So if we say, oh, I'm content to just sit in my little pew. I'm content to just have my little devotions at home. I'm content. It's good. It feels wonderful. I love it when, when God interacts with me in that way. And then he comes like the gazelle. And he says, no, there's an obstacle in your life. And guess what? We're going to conquer it together. 
There's this area in your life that you haven't yet surrendered to me. There's this area that you are compromising in, and we're going to go hard after it. And not only that, as we, as we clean you, we're going to attack the world, and we're going to share the good news of Jesus and the hope that we have that there is forgiveness of sins, that there is life evermore. And so as he's pictured as this one who is, is uh, conquering the mountains, he's pictured as the one who is fulfilling the Great Commission. And that's our call as well. The bride up until this point only has head knowledge. She doesn't have a heart response yet. And so he comes and he lovingly disciplines her by withdrawing his manifest presence or his tangible presence from her heart. I want you to understand, God is not angry with us when, we, when, when he has to do that. It's just like, like a parent. When, when your child disobeys and does something that is harmful to them, it's not because of anger that you are disciplining them. It's because of love. If you, if you were angry at them and you didn't love them, then you wouldn't care that they disobeyed. You wouldn't care that they were hurting themselves. But it's love that draws you to make that choice to discipline. So with God, he's not angry in this uh, because the, the disobedience of our heart is not rebellion. It's immaturity. He's jealously desired her. He wants her to share his values. He wants her to mature as the bride. He wants her to enjoy partnership with him. I tell you, when the first time that you experience partnership with the Lord, when, when he tells you to do something, maybe it's a co-worker he tells you to talk to, or, or he just puts this thought in your mind, you need to say this to this person, and you do that and you suddenly see the fruit of what you did, that's partnership with the Lord's heart. That changes you when you experience how he is interacting with you and using you for his glory. Paragraph B. So he corrects the area of our life that needs correcting. Some mistake God's correction for his rejection. I want you to understand, God hates the sin, yet he delights in the one whom he is disciplining. Sin has to be dealt with. Sin has to be uh, corrected. Our, our heart needs to be changed. Repentance has to come. But it's the Lord who is drawing us because he delights in the one that he has to discipline. The Lord, uh, in our life, he can disapprove of an area uh, without being displeased with us, which is a, a great promise in Scripture. Here's what it says in Proverbs and then in Hebrews. Proverbs 3.12 says, Whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And in Hebrews 12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He disciplines us, is, is the idea of this chastening. He, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. See, his desire is this partaking of his holiness. That's this partnership functioning under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's what he desires. And so he has to do things that will cause us to recognize uh, when we are in disobedience to him. In Revelation 3, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And then there's that great promise that to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. These are the rewards. You know, if you read the letters in Revelation, we've studied those already a little bit uh, in our evening study. But you read those letters when he says to him who overcomes, those are rewards that are given to the saints. If you overcome these areas of compromise in your life, you overcome these areas of sin, of where you're not allowing the Lord to work, you overcome those, he has rewards for those who overcome. In our 
human experience. And this, I think, is where we, we have to correct our mind, correct our thinking. In our human experience, typically correction means rejection. But with God, that is never the case. He corrects us because He loves us and wants to draw us closer. So, again, chapter 3, verse 1, and then verse 2. By night, on my bed, I sought the one I loved. I sought him, but I did not find him. And then she makes a choice. She says, I will rise now, I said, and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. See, here's what happens when God brings discipline. The purpose behind it is to cause our heart to yearn for Him. I, I, when, when we were experiencing here God's tangible presence, it makes you long for more. It makes you want to feel that every time you walk in here. I remember some of the testimonies that were given, even by visitors that would come in. They said, I have never sensed the Holy Spirit's presence so strongly as I did today. It happened more than once that people gave that kind of testimony. But then uh, we noticed that his tangible presence was kind of being withdrawn a bit. And so the deacons and I, we started praying. We asked, Lord, what is it that we are not doing? Why are you removing this tangible presence? We, we long for it. We yearn for it. We, we don't want to lose that. Why are you removing that, Lord? And he revealed to us there was something he had told us to do that we had neglected to do. And that was to start establishing an intercessory prayer ministry. And so as we started focusing on that and, and setting our hearts towards doing that, his blessing started coming. His t presence started being felt again. And so whenever he removes, there's something he wants us to notice, to take a hold of. So if that happens in your life, where you have seasons of great fellowship with the Lord, but then suddenly there's, there's just this feeling of, you're alone. First off, hang on to the promise, you're not alone, right? The enemy will come in and speak to your mind and say, ah, oh, God doesn't love you anymore. That's a bunch of nonsense. He died for you. He gave you everything that he has to give. He even put his Holy Spirit in you as you surrendered your life to him. The very presence of God, the very power of God he placed inside of you. There's no way that he doesn't love you. No way. He loves you in every way. So when the enemy comes, you speak truth. It says we are to stand firm on scripture. We're to use the word of God to refute the accusations of the evil one. So we speak back to him when he says to our mind, God doesn't love you or he's, n he's left you. You speak to him and you say, uh-uh. The word says very clearly. He will never leave me nor forsake me. But there is a discipline taking place in my life right now, and I need to investigate what that is. I need to discover what's going on. Why is God uh, drawing me closer? What is it he's calling me to do? How is he drawing me to uh, conquer obstacles? Which obstacles are there? We need to have these conversations with the Lord. So we're taught in this first part of chapter 3 that the bride, she starts to seek God, but she can't find Him. This is a brand new experience for her. Up until this point, she's been in fellowship with Him, she's been taught by Him, she's been experiencing the great things of sitting under the shade tree with Him, of eating the fruit, uh, the sweet apples, seeing the banquet table, having the banner of love, it's all been wonderful. It's, it's kind of like when you first get saved, everything is beautiful. You're like, yes, I love the Lord. And everything's wonderful. And then you start meeting some of the Lord's people, and uh, it all goes downhill from there, right? Uh, that's no exaggeration, but oftentimes we, we think that way, right? But she is seeking the one that she loves, and not finding him. What is wrong? Well, in verse 2, 
she starts to rise up. She makes a choice in her heart. She says, I will rise now. Right? Because she recognizes what the problem is. She heard the voice of the Lord. She knows what he called her to do. To rise up and to come away with him. And to go to the mountain. To conquer those obstacles. And so she sets her heart towards it. She says, I will rise now. But do you notice something? Where does she go? Does she go to the mountain? No, she doesn't. She goes to the city. Now, when we make one step towards the Lord, guess what? He takes ten towards us. Right? So even though she's not going to the mountain yet, she has risen from her place of comfort. And she says, I'm going to go to where I know there's, there's going to be some teaching for me. What did Jesus tell her to do when she was asking the question of where he feeds the flock? Jesus told her to do a few different things. He said, you need to go to where the shepherd's tents are, right? You need to go to where the flocks are being fed, where, where there is an investment taking place. It's the church that is in view here. When it says she rises and she goes to the city, she's actually going to the spiritual leaders in her life. And she's saying, I need help finding him again. See, that's how this thing works together. When, when we are experiencing drought in our faith, we need to come together instead of forsaking one another. Right? And unfortunately, that's a lot of times what happens is people, as they start feeling correction in their life, as they start losing that sense of God's presence, they start thinking, oh, well, it's got to be the people that I'm hanging out with at church. They're just dragging me down. And so you start withdrawing, and you're like, you know what? I'll skip a Sunday. I'll skip a Wednesday. Oh, now I've skipped two Sundays and two Wednesdays. Now I've skipped a whole month. And before you know it, you're not in fellowship with believers anymore and your life doesn't look anything different than what anybody else's life looks like as outside of the church. Was that God's design? No. His design was for you to be in fellowship to find the answers of what's going on. See, when we, when we come together, there is not only teaching that takes place, but there is also correction that takes place and every one of us is subject to the Lord's correction. It doesn't matter what position you hold in the church or whether you don't hold a position in the church. Every one of us is on a level playing field. The Lord speaks to us, changes us, draws us to go into partnership with Him. So we see that she rises and she sets her heart to leave the comfort zone, to go to the city, in the streets, in the squares, and she's seeking the one that she loves. And she still says, I sought him, but I did not find him. Now as she is doing this, in verse 3 it says, The watchmen who go about the city, they found me, to whom I said, Have you seen the one I love? You know, as, as a, a pastor and as leaders in the church, oftentimes you notice when you're interacting with the congregation, you notice when someone isn't quite right. You notice when there's some problem or something they're struggling with. You can oftentimes see it in their body language. And so the, the watchmen uh, they, they, who go about the city, they found her. And, and they start investing in her. And so she speaks to them. She says, to, to whom I said, have you seen the one I love. She asks that question. She opens her heart to the leadership of the church and says, I, I'm struggling right now. I'm yearning for this closeness with Jesus that I had. I, I want that back. Have you seen him? Can you lead me to where he is? What an awesome thing happens. Like I said, you take one step towards the Lord, he takes ten towards you. The second she submits herself to that spiritual leadership, the second she does that, says, scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. He was on his way to the mountain, remember? 
She sent him away. She said, would you just go to the mountain by yourself, please, and leave me alone? Right? And he withdraws his tangible presence, and then her heart yearns. And she's like, ah, no, no, no. This isn't right. It was so wonderful under the shade tree. It was so wonderful on the banqueting table. It was so wonderful sitting under his banner of love. And I, I feel like I've lost it. I need it again. And so she goes in obedience, rising. She goes and she submits herself to the leadership of the, the spiritual leadership in her life. And scarcely had I passed by them. That means as soon as I had received that counsel, as soon as that investment had been made in my life, as soon as I submitted myself to the counsel and the wisdom of the spiritual leaders over me, as soon as that took place, guess what? I found the one I love. I held him and I would not let him go. What happens next here? is really speaking of the life change that takes place when she does what he's calling her to. Even in just the tiniest little ounce of obedience. She hasn't gone where he's asked her to go. She will, though. We get to chapter 4 next. She will go there with him. She will mature. She will trust his leadership and know that his leadership is good. But right now, he stepped back into the city with her. He said, I see your heart. I see your desire to do what is right. I see your desire for partnership with me. And I love that. I love you. And so she comes. She grabs a hold of him. And she says, I'm not going to let you go. Then verse 4, until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. In scripture, the mother is, is really speaking of the church as a whole uh, and the, the place of where you are birthed, right? We, we are birthed into the faith. And it's the people of God that are used as the catalyst for the Holy Spirit to do His work, right? The Holy Spirit draws people. We speak the word of the Lord to them. They receive it. They repent of their sins. They receive His forgiveness and His Spirit. And they join the fellowship of the believers, right? So it's that mothering process that takes place, that birth, that new birth that is taking place. And here's what she says. Not only is it the bringing... Uh, her testimony to the church of what is happening in her life, but it's also going to change her home. It's going to change in the secret place. You know, you bring something home to your mother's house, the world doesn't know what's going on, but your family does. You know, you think, I, I think of, of some of the experiences that, that I've uh, been a witness to uh, around the world. I think I've mentioned to you before about the, the young lady that was 19 years old in, in the country of Turkey. And she submitted herself to the baptism of believers. Uh, she had come to faith in Jesus. She was from a Muslim home. And she said, I need to be baptized. And her testimony when she was about to be put under the water, her testimony was this. When I go home, I will either be killed or kicked out. See, when you bring Jesus home, things change on an intimate level. Everything in your life needs to become centered around who Jesus is, no matter what the consequences are to you personally. Scarcely had I passed by them, her yearning, her longing for his presence again. When I found the one I love, I held him, would not let him go. Th that, that was so precious to her, to have him back, to be able to touch him and feel him and, and know that he is there with her. She said, I'm going to bring him with me wherever I go. I'm, I'm gonna even I'm even gonna go into those little places that nobody knows about, and I'm gonna let him have ownership of it. What little areas do we hold on to? 
in our comfort that the Lord wants to have ownership over. So and then it goes on. Verse 5. It says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. This is a, a, a repetition of a phrase that we've looked at in previous chapters. Because here's what's happened. See, the Spirit, He ordains strategic seasons. The, the Lord is a very strategic God. He, he, he knows the beginning from the end. He sees our whole life. And He knows, in order for you to get to the mountain with me, there are things that need to happen. And I'm going to make them happen. Because you belong to me. And so what He does is He ordains these strategic seasons. It's the Spirit that is speaking here. In verse 5. He desires to establish us in a new uh, and vibrant relationship with the Lord. Give us new insight into His heart. He says, do not stir up the Spirit charged other believers not to disrupt what is going on in the bride. Now oftentimes, what I've seen take place in the church is when someone truly wants the Lord's presence back in their life and they submit themselves under the leadership then there's, there's judgment and, and condemnation that takes place because of uh, maybe the sin issues that, that were there or, uh, or just a, a lack of commitment or, or whatever it is. But the Lord isn't like that. He doesn't bring condemnation. That's the enemy. There's a work that's taking place in her heart. Correction is his desire, not condemnation, not judgment. So the Spirit charges other believers not to disrupt or disturb the bride in this season with their opinions and their judgments. I think that's a danger in the church in particular. As we seek to function in the power of the Holy Spirit, we seek to hear the voice of the Lord. We need to be careful what things we speak to one another and not allow for uh, judgment to be proclaimed from our lips, but to really allow the Spirit to give us the right words to say at the right time. Satan is very good at twisting our intentions now, my mom is a, uh, is a writer, and uh, she's authored a, a book and written a lot of different uh, magazine articles and things like that. And I remember growing up, she had a typewriter. Um, if you don't know what that is, then you're a whole lot younger than me. But uh, a, ty a typewriter, you know, click, click. Yeah. Uh, so she had this little notice on her typewriter, and it was kind of a... Uh, a transliteration quote from one of the Proverbs. And she said, Lord, it was a prayer. Lord, help me to remember that my words have power to either kill or to give life. And it's so true. And we need to be careful in the church that we don't bring condemnation on, on those who are uh, struggling with an area in their life. But that we help in bringing loving correction, just like the Lord does. So the Spirit tells those who were insensitive to His ways to not disturb the bride in this season. And He says in the phrase, until it pleases, uh, the, the Hebrew there is, is correctly translated, until she pleases. So do not awaken love until she pleases. There is a, uh, a work of the Spirit that is taking place here. So I wonder if this morning, you know, in the last few weeks, different things we have talked about, 
uh, there's been this, this call to rise up and to uh, go to the mountain, to, to do the things the Lord has laid on your heart to do. And I wonder if maybe you've been resisting whatever it is that He's calling you to. Maybe because of fear. Maybe because of seeking more understanding about it. In the Lord's eyes, His goal is clear. He wants you to get to the place where He's called you to go. The route you're going to take is really up to you, right? And He, he will try to guide you, but every time you stray off, He has to plant some new awakening measure to get you back to where you're supposed to be. I think the shortest route is the best, right? Think of it this way. At the end of your life, what do you want the testimony to be of what people say about you? If they look at your life and they say, wow, that person really lived for Jesus, and I could see it their entire life. Or, or do you want... Your testimony to be, while well, that person really struggled and resisted what the Lord wanted to do, we all were seeing the work that the Lord wanted to do, but they kept on resisting. And then finally, the last year of their life, they functioned in what He called them to. It's kind of sad to waste your life on the journey when the destination is where the fruit is, right? The Lord desires His people to be in partnership with Him. I want to invite the worship team to come up. If there's something in your life that you haven't surrendered to Jesus, you're still compromising in this area, why don't you just ask the Lord to take that away? Ask the Lord to change your heart in that regard. Ask the Lord to... to help you with this struggle. If there's something that maybe He's asked you to do, you know for sure, without any doubt, you know this is what He wants you to do, but you've been resisting that because of fear. Then let today be the day that you say, you know what? I'm going to trust your leadership, Jesus. I'm going to trust what you want to do in my life. I don't know what the Lord is, is doing in your heart. You do. I ask you to have ears to hear and hearts to respond to whatever it is He has asked you to do. Imagine what the Lord will do with an army of believers that are completely submitted to His leadership. Imagine what that could look like if all of us were com completely committed to the leadership of Jesus. Imagine what this city could look like after we function in such 100% obedience. We listen to what he says, we do what he says, we invite people to join in what he's doing. This city would look really different. You know, last week we prayed against the rampant drug use, the sale of drug in this community. We prayed against corruption. We prayed against all kinds of things. They're all right here. Open the door. Walk outside. You're in the middle of it. Does the Lord want to speak to that? Does He want to change that? Of course He does. But who's He going to use? It's you and me. We don't wait for somebody else to do it. He's already called to the mountain. How are you part of that? What do you need to surrender to? Let's stand together.